Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to church today on this Memorial Day weekend. We're so glad that you are here with us this morning. I want to tell you about a couple of things. First, today you should have picked up your third sticker. You have been to Mount Moriah where we visited with Abraham and Isaac. You've been to Mount Sinai where we looked at the Ten Commandments. And today we're going to Mount Carmel. So uh, I hope you picked up that sticker and you are up to speed. We have four more mountains to explore that you'll fill in stickers on the back of your uh, journal that we've given to you. Uh, the deadline for Youth Week sign-up is Tuesday of this week, and you can go there, www.parkav.church, the new website, uh, and you can sign up for that. Make sure you do that. And uh, would you remember also to fill out your communication cards? Uh, you can do that by filling out the paper one we've given to you, or you can do it online as well. We're so glad that you are with us today. It's uh, Memorial Day weekend. And uh, we want to pause this morning and remember all of those. I tried to look up the number. How many people have given up their lives in service, in the service, for us? And it was, it's two million close to it or more. And uh, these are the people who never got the opportunity to take their uniforms off. They never got that chance because they gave up their lives. So I wanted you to watch this uh, memorial to them. To the brave men and women who stood up for freedom, who answered the call and fought for our nation, who paid the ultimate price and never came back. To the American soldier, we thank you. To the mothers and fathers who raised a hero. To the brothers and sisters with an empty space. To the sons and daughters who have only memories. To the wives and husbands who bear the void with pride. To all who've lost a soldier they love no gift could repay your sacrifice. No tribute could match our admiration. No word can contain our gratitude. But still, it deserves to be said. We remember you. We salute you. And we honor you today. honor to those who deserve honor, and they do deserve our honor. Would you pray with me? Uh, Father, we pause on this very special day to once again give honor to those who deserve it, to those men and women who paid the ultimate price for us, that we might experience the freedom that we experience in these United States, that we might be able to worship you freely without fear of retribution or harm. We thank you that we can live free because of their sacrifice. We pray today for their families and for those who recall and remember all that they gave so that we might be free. Would you bless them and would you honor them today, please? And join us here as we worship you on this special day, a day where we recognize your presence among us, the one true God. There is no other. So join us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now will you stand and greet those around you and uh, we'll continue to worship together.
this morning? That's the fiddle more than it is the violin on that song, isn't it? Y'all are supposed to kind of chuckle at that. There you go. Y'all awake this morning? That should have woken you up. Everybody say amen. amen. Crown him Lord of all. And y'all like exclamation points, and that one has an exclamation point after it. I have been reading the book that Jimmy is preaching from uh, by Joe B. Martin. And he's a wonderful author, and I have gotten caught up in his enthusiasm to preach the gospel. And in next week's chapter, he talks about the hymn we're about to sing. And I had already chosen it when I read it, How Great Thou Art. It's a good one. And he says in his uh, chapter how undone he is by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he particularly mentions verse 3. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die. Do you know the next line? I scarce can take it in. And he said when he looks over the church people singing that, he doesn't understand how they can have a lack of expression. Because he says he's undone. And it goes on that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. We should not take that lightly, should we? So this morning when we stand to sing, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. Tell me that next line. How great thou art. Would you choose this morning to let your heart not be undone by the gospel? Can you scarce to take it in? Ooh, that'd be a powerful worship time. That's our prayer this morning. Let's stand and sing How Great Thou Art. <laughs>
that's the way to start, isn't it? Now we affirm our faith. What is it that we believe? We don't do this just to go through the motions. We do it because this is what we confess to be our faith from 1 Timothy. There is one God and there is one mediator, Christ Jesus, who came as a ransom for all to whom we testify. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners and was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed in throughout the world, taken up in glory. Great indeed is the mystery of the gospel. Amen. be seated. I invite you to bow your heads as you join me in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, there is so much, so, so much to bring to you this morning. God, it feels like the world is heavy right now. Lord, as we celebrate this Memorial Day and we remember all of those who have given their lives so sacrificially, God, we give thanks for each one of them. We pray for the families that mourn them. And God, we pray because we know that next Memorial Day, There will be more to remember. Oh God, be with all of those who fight for our freedom. Be with the families who love and support them. And oh God, raise churches up, raise believers up that witness to them. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for each of them. God, we do come today and we pray again just for your hand of healing to fall over this world. Lord, COVID is still out there and it's peaking its head, but there's a lot of other things. And God, we pray especially this morning for uh, two men who are strong in the faith, Lord, who are battling this morning. Or we pray for John McGowan and his fight with COVID and God, we pray for V.L. Daughtry, a pillar of this church. Lord, we pray that you would be with him, be with his family, and that you would bring healing to both of these men, that you would bring them strength, and that you would bring comfort and peace to their families as they walk through sickness with them. God, we also come today, Lord, and we lift up our families who are grieving It just seems like all of a sudden we have lost so many. Lord, people in this church and people attached to people in this church. God, I pray that you would be with us. I pray that you would give us the strength to know that when our life ends in this world, it continues on in you and the next. Lord, let that give us hope for those that we have lost. Oh, Lord, would you make us a church that knows how to love those who are grieving. God, help us to recognize that uh, there are no answers sometimes. There's just our presence. So that we can come and bring the presence of the Holy Spirit with us to those who need you so desperately. 
God, we pray this morning for our country. God, for all of these shootings and just mass craziness that is happening, Lord, there, there is an evil uh, in this world that I don't think we can even begin to understand. God, we see glimpses of what evil is able to do. But Lord, you know the fullness of that. And so God, we thank you and we praise you that this morning we are not a people who are hopeless that look into these situations of death and loss and, and evil and anger and sickness. And uh, we don't lose hope. Because the worst evil that can come in this world, Lord, you are greater. Jesus tells us that he has overcome this world. He has overcome the evil in it. And God, we just ask right now that you would be with us. Let us be lights in a dark world. Lord, show us how to put you first. God, today, uh, Jimmy's going to share your wisdom with us about idolatry and things that we put before you. God, I can't help but think that's the source of so much trouble that we're suffering right now in this world is that we have not put you where you belong in this country or in our heart, in our family, in our home. So Lord, we just come today and we ask that you would help us Lord, to realign those things. Lord, forgive us. Because we, most of the time, think we know best. Oh, Lord, guide us. Be with our church. Help us to be a people who seek your face every day. Lord, we pray that you would hear our voices as we raise them together and pray the prayer that Jesus taught so long ago when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We just want to thank y'all for being here today and just always being such a huge part of this church and, and worship here. There is an opportunity for you to give to the church this morning. You can drop your offering and your communication card in the basket or the plates as you leave this morning. You can give online. There's a slide that's up here that'll show you how you can do that. But we just want to thank y'all uh, for, for being faithful to continue to give to the Lord. You make all the difference in the world. And any children that want to go to Children's Church, uh, now's your time. You can make your way to that door.
You know, week after week, we are blessed beyond measure, aren't we, with the music that we have here in these services. I'm so grateful for the choir and for the way you usher us into God's presence. Today's mountain view is uh, Mount Carmel, and it has to do with choices. It has to do with a choice, a very important choice. You know, somewhere along the, the way, uh, I guess those who teach us how to parent our children decided that it was a good idea that we start giving our children a choice. Have you, have you understood that? You know, when we were coming along, we would just tell Jim, this is what you're going to do. And, and that kind of worked with my generation. But now we give our kids a choice. We'll say, do you want to wear the red shirt or the blue shirt, right? You give them an option. It was interesting. Last night I was watching America's Funniest Videos, and, and there was a one particular dog, I think it was an Australian sheepdog, and it was in its crate, and the master said to it, okay, uh, you want to go for a walk? And the dog was really excited, came running out of the crate, and then he said, and then we'll get a bath, and the dog turned around and went right back into the crate. He did it again. He says, come on, let's get a treat. We'll go for a walk. The dog so excited, came out, and then we'll get a bath right back in. You know, choices are hard sometimes, but the choice that we're going to learn about today is perhaps the most important choice we face in today's world. But before we climb this mountain, I want to start with a test. It, it involves a, a question, and uh, it's an all or nothing test, because here's the deal. If you pass the test, then we'll look at today's mountain. If you don't, we have to go back and look at last week's mountain again. So here's the question that goes with this test. What was the first commandment that God gave in the Ten Commandments? Who knows it? Shout it out. No other gods. Way to go, choir. Now, for the rest of you who didn't remember that, there's a second question. You know, we believe in redemption as Christians, so I'm going to give you a redemption question. Here's the next one. What was the second commandment? Does anyone know? No idols. No idols. That's right. So the second commandment, Exodus 20, verse 4, says, you must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You just can't do it. Pretty simple, right? No other gods, no other gods, and no idols or images. So, so then why, uh, why, why is it so hard? And, and why did God make those the first two commandments? Well, it's because of all of the so-called little g gods that, that people worshipped at the time. It's amazing. If you go and look, you, you can find a God, a little God, little G, uh, for almost anything. If you needed a little rain, you had to pray and worship the rain God. If you needed some flowers, you would pray uh, to the flower God. If you needed a baby, you would pray to the fertility God. I mean, there was a God for everything in these cultures that the Israelites found themselves in. I like what Joby Martin, the writer of this book, says. He says, the problem with every idol in every day and every age is that idols make promises they don't have the ability to keep. Because we, in our faithlessness, give them power they don't have and never have had. What, whatever or whoever you idolize will let you down. And when they do, here's what we do. We demonize them. Or it. That's what we do. And, and so the story of Mount Carmel is it's found in 1 Kings. You got your Bibles. I want you to follow along with me a little bit. I'm going to scan a little bit and then we'll come to our key passage. But it involves King Ahab. If you remember anything about the kings in the Old Testament, King Ahab is ruling in Israel now. And we find him in 1 Kings uh, chapter. 16 there's a reference to him in verse 31 here's what we see it said and as though it if it were not enough to follow the sinful example of Jeroboam he King Ahab married Jezebel the daughter of King Ethbaal of the Sidonians and he began to bow down and worship to Baal Baal well he built altars for Baal and set up what was known as Asherah poles, Asherah. Baal was the god who brought the rains for crops. Some refer to him as the storm deity. And Asherah was the goddess who brought fertility to the livestock and to wives. 
So under King Ahab, here's what happened. The Israelites had become Baal worshipers with the enthusiastic support and sponsorship of Jezebel, King Ahab's wife. But they also remained God worshipers. So they were doing both. They had Baal on one hand and God on the other. They wanted both, and so they worshiped both. Here's what the Bible, though, says about King Ahab. In 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 33, it's going to say this. He did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than any of the other kings of Israel before him. How would you like for that to be your tag? He did more to provoke the anger of the Lord than anyone else before him. And, and here's the problem. The, the problem is this. We, we demote God to the level of so-called little G gods when we worship both. It, and it dishonors God when we do that. So King Ahab and the Israelites thought that they could just go on without making an exclusive choice between God and Ahab. So the Lord tells, sends the prophet Elijah to go confront King Ahab. It's in uh, 1 Kings 18, verse 17 and 18. And so he shows up with the king and he says this, when Ahab, the king, saw him, he exclaimed, so is it really you, you troublemaker of Israel? Now, Elijah is the prophet of God. But Ahab sees him as a troublemaker. And look what Elijah says in response. I have made no trouble for Israel. You and your family are the troublemakers. For you have refused to obey the commands of the Lord and have worshipped the images of Baal instead. Troublemakers. You're a troublemaker. No, you're the troublemaker. You know, we're living at a time in the world today, in the culture today, when people who believe in the word of God and stand for the Lord are called troublemakers. You know, in reality, though, the real troublemakers are those in culture who stand against the word of God. So in a sense, Elijah was a troublemaker because what he was doing was he was standing up to the false religion of the time and calling the people to exclusive uh, Worship of God, exclusive loyalty, exclusive honor to God. So maybe we should be troublemakers in the world today because there's a lot of false religion around us even now. So here we go. Elijah sets up a showdown. This, this next part uh, of chapter 18 of 1 Kings reads like a, an epic summer movie. I mean, there's so much uh, excitement in, in this. I remember the first time I read it, I couldn't believe that this was in the Bible. It was so good. And so we're going to pick up with 1 Kings chapter 18, what Elijah tells Ahab. And I'll invite you to stand. This is our key passage for today. Starting with verse 19, here's what he says. Now, summon all Israel to join me at Mount Carmel, along with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah, who are supported by Jezebel. So Ahab summoned all the people of Israel and the prophets to Mount Carmel. Then Elijah stood in front of them and said, How much longer will you waver? hobbling between two opinions if the lord is god follow him but if baal is god then follow him but the people were completely silent this is the word of god for the people of god thanks be to god please be seated i i, I love this uh this little passage right here i mean he, here he here he he calls them out he calls them to this showdown on the top of the mountain. And, and he tells them, he, he, he confronts them by saying, how much longer will you waver? It says a uh, hobbling between two opinions. How much longer will you do that? Uh, it's really interesting because the, it says that the people were completely silent. Why do you think they were completely silent? It's like they'd been caught. It's like they knew, they, they certainly knew better, and, and here they are, 
listening to the truth being spoken by the prophet of God, they were completely silent. What, was, what could they say? But you got to choose. It's got to be one or the other. Certainly they knew better. This, this Hebrew word for hobbling, is, is, it's technically or literally transcribed as limping. Limping. Like someone who struggles to walk. They have a limp and they have difficulty walking. And so Elijah says, climb this mountain with me and you're going to see who the real God is. Who's the one that really has power? And so Ahab called all of them together and demanded that they would go to the mountain, including all the false prophets. And, and here is Elijah. He stands as one prophet of God against 450 prophets of Baal and 400 of Asherah. The odds are stacked against him. He tells them, build an altar here on this mountain. And here's what you're going to do. You're going to build this altar and you're going to sacrifice a bull. It's interesting that Elijah tells them that because the bull was the symbol of Baal. And so it's like God is saying, I'm going to take the very symbol of your God and we're going to sacrifice that. And so he tells them, prepare this, set it on the wood, and then here's what we're going to do. We're, we're going to call to your God, and he'll set the wood on fire if he is the real God. And so they go first to prepare everything. They start calling on Baal from morning until noon, the scripture says. They're hollering, oh, Baal, answer us. And all they got was crickets, nothing. It says in 1 Kings 18, interesting word there. It says they danced. Here's the word again, hobbling around the altar they made, limping around the altar they made. There's that word. And, and then the part that you've got to love, I love this part, Elijah begins to mock them. It's, it's really interesting. In 1 Kings 18, 27, here's what he says. It says about noontime, Elijah began mocking them. You'll have to shout louder, he scoffed, for surely he is a god. Perhaps he's daydreaming. Now get this part, the Bible actually says this, or he's relieving himself. Well, that's interesting. Or maybe he is away on a trip or is asleep or needs to be wakened. So you know what they did? They shouted louder. They tried to wake up Baal, but still nothing happened. It says, the Bible says they did this all afternoon with no response. And then Elijah says, C come over here to the altar of the Lord. He says, watch what happens now. They dig a trench around the altar, Elijah does. And so he instructs the prophets. He says, now get four large jars of water and pour it on the wood. I want you to do that not once, not twice, but three times. Soak the wood. And don't you imagine that if you were the prophets and the people standing there, all of Israel, it says, were gathered there. Don't you think they were saying, he's setting up an impossible situation. Why, why is he doing this? It's impossible. But, but, but here's, here's the beauty. Impossible situations perfectly position you and me to see God move in a way that only he can move. So Elijah wants to make it crystal clear that the, the only one who can do this is God. So soak the wood, soak the altar. And then watch what happens in verse 36. At the usual time for offering the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and he prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all of this at your command. Pray. He prayed so that the people will know. I, I, I love that. And, and it teaches me this. Maybe, maybe I need to in my prayers. Maybe I need to say something like that. I need to say, Lord, answer this prayer so that my family will see your faithfulness. Lord, answer this prayer so that all of this community will know that you alone are God. I, I need to maybe start praying with a so that in my prayer. It, it's not just that I need what I'm asking for or I desire what I'm asking for, but I want to make you, God, glorified in it. And so I pray, God, would you do this so that you alone are known as God? 
Would you do it? So that these people will know that you are God. Eliza prays. I love that. And then look what happens. Verse 38, it says, Immediately the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell down on the ground and cried out, The Lord, He is God. Yes, the Lord is God. I mean, immediately in response to that prayer. Oh, there can be no doubt now. There can be no doubt. I, I love this story. It does read like an epic movie, but it's a true story. And, and I read it. Maybe you read it. I would have read it before and probably said this. How in the world could these people worship idols after God had done all he had done to bring them out of Egypt? I mean, surely they knew better. These little carved images that they would hold up and worship could do nothing for them. And they knew that. Why would they turn to something that they created, especially when that idol had let them down time and time again? These are the children of God. The, the, these are not some foreigners. These are the Israelites who are doing this. Did you catch that? The children of God. And wouldn't you know, wouldn't you think that they would know that God himself is enough? And I read that story and I think, wow, they should have gotten that. But then here's the other thing I do. I'll say, well, that doesn't apply to me. This story doesn't apply to me. I, I, I don't have idols in my life. Really? Well, what do we do when God doesn't provide what we want? What do we do when we don't get the answers that we want? I, I like what jo, Joby Martin did. He made a list of what we do. And, and I want to quote it to you. Listen to what he says. He says, do you turn to money for security? Do, do you turn to appeal to take away the pain? He says, do you turn to a bottle to help forget what's going on in your life? Do you turn to that girl at work who's not your wife? to validate you because you don't feel validated at home. He says, do you turn to one more Netflix show just to avoid reality? Do you turn to Facebook hoping someone will like you? Remember what he said, that quote up front I gave to you? He said, whatever or whoever you idolize will let you down, will let you down. And, and so the question for us, I believe, from this story is the same that it was for them. How long are you going to limp between two different opinions? How long are we going to do that? How long is the world going to do that right now? Elijah is telling the people that their attempt to have the best of both worlds is actually crippling them. Wavering, hobbling, limping, they all express the same idea. It's divided loyalty between God and anything else is crippling. It's crippling. You know, the reality is most of us have limped between two opinions at some point in our lives, and maybe we still do it even now. Uh, you know, the, the hymn, Come Thou Fount, says, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, right? And we do. Our false gods today, our divided loyalty is anything that we put above him it could be our jobs or our homes or our children. It could be our, our, our wealth or our security. It could be the opinions of others. It could even be our faith. But make no mistake about it. E either God is first in our lives or he isn't. A and, and if he isn't, then there's an idol involved. Let me say that again. That's really important. Either God is first in our lives or he isn't. And if he isn't, then there's some idol involved. And if we don't resolve our limping in God's favor, then we're going to be crippled the rest of our days. It's just true. So at some point, here's what we got to do. At some point, we got to choose. We got to make up our minds. Are we going to follow the Lord God Almighty or are we going to follow some other little G God? Is that what we're going to do? You know, Joshua, before we get to Elijah, 
called the Israelites to make a choice. Choose today whom you will serve. But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Choose this day, Joshua said. Elijah says, you choose. If you're going to follow God, then follow him. If you're going to follow Baal, then follow him. It's like this. You choose for yourself. You make the decision today. And just make a decision. If it's money that you're going to follow, then serve it with everything you're made of. Go ahead. We can neglect our family to have more money. Or or we can get as much as we can and sometimes have to step on others along the way or crush others. If it's love and romance, if that's what we're going to serve, then serve them. If it's approval that we're looking for, if that's our little G God, then take a selfie every minute and put all the filters you want to on it and post it online and see if you can get some likes. I mean, it's a choice. And that's what Joshua said. That's what Elijah is saying. And that's what the Lord is saying to us today. And sadly, friends, when we look around the world today, do you know how many people are choosing the little G gods in life? Too many. But if Jesus is who he says he is, and and if you and I believe that he is the Christ who came to do for us what you and I could never do for ourselves, if he is the Lord, if he is the Messiah, if he is the Son of God, then listen, choose to worship him and him alone. Get rid of all the other little G's. On this mountain, Mount Carmel, God had to confront the Israelites with the truth of who he is. That's what he had to do. And the reality is for us, one day he's going to ask us to climb a mountain to confront our understanding of him too. Which means a showdown is coming and we'll have to choose one day. So what's the rest of the story? Well, you can read it. You really ought to read all of chapter 18. The rest of the story, let me just tell you, heads up, spoiler alert, it didn't end well for the prophets of Baal. You should read it. It's in uh, verse 40 of chapter 18. But, But here's the reality. People who put their faith in Jesus Christ don't limp along in life. They don't. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says they will run and not grow weary. It says they will rise up on eagles' wings, those who worship him and follow him. That's what they do. That's what they do. To follow someone requires us to take steps, one after another. And we have to keep taking them all the days of our life. So let me just ask you today, friends, what step is he asking you to take to stop limping through this life? Well, here's some ideas. Overlook, next step, here's the first one. What are the idols? What are the little G gods in our lives? We need to know. We need to think about it and to address it in our lives. Look at this second one. Am I trying to worship God and the idols around me? Am I trying to have a both and? Do I think I can go through life hobbling, limping between two opinions? And then number three, what idols must I get rid of? And and here's the great thing to do. Just ask God. God, I, I don't really know what idols I have in my life, but would you show me? And I believe he will because he's a jealous God. You know, and Jesus says no one can serve two masters, right? So he'll show us. And then the fourth one is this. Just today is the day for me to decide whether I will follow the Lord or someone or something else. Today. Choose today. Today. Climb the mountain. You'll know today. Father, thank you for for these lessons. Sometimes they're hard lessons. And I know that that had to be a hard lesson for the Israelites and all of those prophets that climbed that mountain with Elijah. But you showed them, you revealed to them who you are. And there was no doubt about it. But for some of us, we still carry doubts. We still limp through this life trying to have two opinions about who we should worship. 
you and someone else or something else. And we've learned today that's just not right. So help us to have the courage to deal with it so that we'll stop limping, walking through life crippled. We want you to be our God, our one and only true God. We want to worship you and you alone because nobody, no other little G God, no other uh, prophet, no other entity has done for us what you have done for us through Jesus Christ. So help us, God, to have undivided loyalty to you and you alone. And we believe you'll help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our final hymn is, Come Thou Found of Every Blessing. And that third verse does say, Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. But then it says, Take my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. And that's what we have to be willing to do, to give our hearts completely to God. So let's stand and sing, Come Thou Found. <laughs> When we read stories like that, we think, man, that seems a little harsh, you know. It's, but, but it's all because of God's love for us and his desire for us to have the life that he has for us. And so when we share messages like this, they're shared in love because we all need that kind of love. So go in God's love that others might see in you the love of Christ and be drawn to him. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Love you guys. See you next week.